Wenn es eine ikonische Marke gibt, die für Kentucky und Bourbon gleichermaßen steht wie keine andere und unsere Fantasie auf Reisen schickt, dann ist das Jim Beam. Wir haben am 4. Juli, dem amerikanischen Nationalfeiertag, die Destillerie von Jim Beam in Clermont, Kentucky besucht und uns über das Gelände und durch die Brennerei führen lassen. Noch vor dem großen Ansturm der Besucher, die sich auch durch 40 Grad im Schatten nicht abschrecken ließen. Dieses Video nimmt Sie mit auf die Tour über die verschiedenen Stationen und sie beginnt im Bus mit einer historischen Einführung über die Master Distiller von Jim Beam. David M. Beam, they're very creative with names, weren't they? Moved our distillery just south of here to Bardstown, Kentucky. Uh, did that for a couple of reasons. Bardstown had its own telegraph, which for the day and age was pretty high tech, uh, but it also had its own railroad system. He expanded our distribution, he turned us into a nationally recognized brand. Now that brings us to the name we all know and love, right there in the center of your tickets, Jim Beam. He of course is our namesake, but we also call him the savior of our company. He brought us through three very hard times. First was World War I, also the Great Depression, and then also those nasty, nasty 13 years we don't like to talk about a ton here. Those were of course Prohibition, right? Um, after that, T. Jeremiah Beam led our company. Uh, he was our global ambassador for bourbon. He pushed us internationally at that point. Uh, now, Booker No led our company after that. He was Jim's grandson, and he invented our small batch bourbons. He gave us Booker's, Baker's, Basil Hayden, and of course, Knob Creek as well. Now, our seventh generation, he's our current master distiller. His name is Fred No. He's a wonderful guy. He's given us those products like Devil's Cut, uh, Red Stag, Signature Craft Series, uh, and plenty more. We'll talk about them today too. Now on our tour today, uh, we're going to be starting out in our craft distillery here. It is sort of small scale, but we'll get to see how bourbon is made grain all the way to the barrel. Uh, after that, we'll take you to see the real deal stuff, right? Our actual main production facility. We call it the big still house. Um, we'll of course visit a bottling line. You guys will get to make your own bottle of Knob Creek single barrel. Take it home with you today. Uh, and then of course we're going to finish with tasting, which is the most important part of our tour today, right? <laughs> Y'all guys ready? ready? Yeah. Let's go. So we're in our well house right now. We're going to be spending most of our 90 minutes here today in this small dark room. Okay. Oh. Sound good? I'm just kidding. We'll get out of here. <laughs> Hopefully we don't have any claustrophobes today. Uh, but it's the well house. We modeled this one after the original one that Jim Beam built in the 30s when he brought us back after those years of prohibition. Um, now underneath the grate here is our limestone rock bed. Uh, that limestone rock bed is very important to us. It's one of the reasons why Kentucky is sort of at an advantage for making bourbon as compared to other states and other areas. Now, our limestone does a couple things to our water. It enriches that water with calcium, good strong bones. You can tell your doctors I said that, right? <laughs> See how far that gets you. It also naturally filters out iron for us. When iron's in our water, it kind of gives it a bitter flavor. Ours is filtered out, which means we have a nice sweet flavored water. Uh, and we get it naturally, so we love using that sweet flavored water uh, to cook our grains in. That's the first step in our process of making bourbon. So our limestone water is one of those reasons why. Another one of the reasons is our corn. We're really darn good at growing corn here in Kentucky. We have a great climate for it. Uh, climate is actually one of those reasons as well. We have hot summers here. We have cold winters. Lots of variation in our weather over the course of one year. And that's good for the aging process, which we'll talk about uh, later on on our tour today. So those are a few of the reasons why Kentucky sort of at an advantage. Now, bourbon doesn't have to be made here in Kentucky. It does have to be made in the U.S., though, to be called a bourbon whiskey. It's our native spirit. Uh, so international policy is that it has to be made here in the United States to be called a bourbon. Now, that being said, 95% of the entire world's supply of bourbon is made right here in Kentucky. And Jim Beam produces roughly a third of that, uh, just to give you guys an idea of the size and scale of our operations here in Claremont. All right. This is about 14 square feet, okay? That is approximately how much land of corn that it takes to make one bottle of bourbon, okay? Not one barrel, one bottle. Uh, so we go through a lot of corn here. It is our most important grain to us. Uh, one of our rules of bourbon that I'm sure you guys know, one of the rules of bourbon is that our recipe that we use has to be made of at least 51% corn. Corn has to be the majority grain in our recipe, all right? Uh, now here at Jim Beam, you can see we actually use well over 51%. Uh, the Jim Beam recipe is actually closer to about two thirds. And I don't know the exact percentages, all right? Technically that's a family secret. They don't give that to me, right? It's probably floating around on the internet somewhere. You could probably Google search it if you wanted to. 
Uh, but we use well over 51%. Uh, and it's mainly just because we love to get those sweet and nutty flavors out of our corn, okay? Corn is kind of earthy in tone, uh, but it gives us a really sweet and really nutty flavor. Now our rye, right here, is gonna give us a nice spicy contrast to the sweetness of the corn. Uh, notes of cereal, notes in caramel, uh, Rye is really dry, really peppery in flavor, right? It gives us a nice contrast to that sweetness. Now you don't have to use rye as your second grain. You said you went to Maker's Mark, right? What do they use right there instead of rye? They use their wheat, right? It's a red winter wheat. Uh, that's gonna softer grain, it's gonna give them more of the sweetness of the corn, okay? We just like to have that spiciness of the rye. Malted barley, it's gonna give us a really deer, uh, doughy, beery flavor, right? Uh, if you're familiar with the beer making process, you're gonna know that's why, right? Uh, we don't actually pull a lot of our flavor from the malted barley. You don't really think of coffee and cocoa as flavor notes on a bourbon, right? Uh, we use the least amount of it, but it is important, even though we don't pull a lot of flavor from it. It has enzymes inside of it that when we cook these grains in our mash cooker right over there, those enzymes are gonna go to work for us, converting all the starches in those grains into sugars. And we need them to be converted into sugars for when we're talking about fermentation later on. It's the next step in our process. Uh, so we do have to be careful with those enzymes, right? We have to be careful how we cook our grains. What we do when we cook our grains, we bring water up to a boil here in our mash cooker. Uh, we bring that water up to a boil. We're gonna start adding in those grains one at a time. We're gonna add in our corn first. Uh, it's a really hearty grain, it cooks really slow, so we let it cook the longest amount of time. Uh, so we add in that corn first, second we're going to add in the rye, and finally we're going to add in that malted barley. Okay. Uh, by the time we've added in the malted barley though, we've brought the water down to about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, we don't want to fry out those enzymes, first thing. Uh, so we've got to bring that water down and be careful how we cook it. Also, we just don't want to cook out any of the flavors of our grains. Right. Uh, we don't want to lose any flavor or as little flavor as possible, right? Uh, all the way up into the barrel. So we gotta be careful how we cook them, gotta be careful how we ferment and distill and so on and so forth, right? Any questions about our grains? Anything else the house is running? Questions, no. Uh, all of our corn is locally sourced. Somewhere in the 90% range is all sourced from right here in Kentucky. Uh, the other few percent sourced from Indiana. Uh, we wish we could source that locally for our other two grains, but obviously we can't. Uh, it doesn't grow well in our climate here. Most of our rye is from Canada. If you've heard of a Canadian rye whiskey, uh, they grow a lot of rye up there. Also, our malted barley is mostly from the northern U.S., places like North Dakota um, uh, is where we get our malted barley from. But almost all of our corn is locally sourced right here in Kentucky. And of course, this is field corn. It's cattle corn, right? It's not the sweet corn that you're getting in the grocery store, right? Uh, it's, it's more of that cattle corn or field corn, as people call it. So. All right, fermentation is the next step in our process. The single most important part about fermentation is our Pac-Man up here. I don't know why he's a Pac-Man, but that's our yeast, all right. Uh, yeast is very important to fermentation. What he's gonna do is eat those sugars that we talked about, right? They're converted from the starches in our grains. He's gonna eat those sugars and give us three byproducts up there. The first of which is heat. The reaction is gonna produce its own heat and we're probably gonna feel that heat later on uh, when we visit our fermentation room. It's also gonna give us CO2 gas, carbon dioxide, all right? Uh, you'll probably see the fermentation tanks bubbling up, right? It's not boiling, far from it. Uh, it's just that CO2 gas, the carbon dioxide being produced from within the batch, it's rising to the surface to escape. We're also gonna get our alcohol, okay? Every drop of alcohol in our whiskey uh, comes from this fermentation reaction right here. We're gonna get all those liquid ethanols and glycerols, things like that, okay? By the time we have a fully fermented batch in one of our tanks, we're gonna be looking at about 8% alcohol. 8%. Doesn't sound too high, right? More like a beer than a liquor. That's because it is, right? We've just made a beer up until this point. Uh, we call it distiller's beer. Now, ours is gross. You're not gonna to wanna to take home a six pack of our beer, right? Uh, it's gonna be kinda of sour, kinda of bitter, depending on what stage in the process it is. Uh, but we just have a beer. We're taking that beer to our distillery uh, we're distilling it, condensing down that alcohol content, raising the percentage up, right? That's how that works. Now we have three fermentation tanks in here. Uh, these ones are small, they're about 500 gallons. We have three of them because the process of fermentation takes roughly three days, right? Uh, that way, every single day, one of these tanks is ready to go. 
uh, we're emptying it out and we're taking that distiller's beer to the distillery. We always have a constant supply that way, right? Uh, now, like I said, each of these is 500 gallons. So every day we're distilling about 500 gallons here in our craft distillery. We can get about one barrel a day uh, out of those 500 gallons. Uh, so that's sort of the pace that we run out here in our craft distillery. Now everything in here is fully functional. Nothing that we make in here actually goes to market though. Uh, it's more just our playground. We can kind of experiment. It's an expensive playground, <laughs> but it's our playground nonetheless, right? Uh, we can sort of experiment. If Fred has a new idea for something, uh, he can cook it up in here, those types of things. That's really what we use it for. So. so right behind me here, this is our craft distillery. When we have that fully fermented distiller's beer, we're gonna take it, we're gonna pour it down the top of this real tall column over there on the left. Uh, it's our beer still. Now this one in here is actually kind of small. This one's only about 16 feet tall. We'll see the main one later on. Uh, but it has 14 separation trays inside of there. Those are made of copper. Uh, as that beer is passing down through those separation trays, we're injecting hot steam into the bottom of the column. Uh, the steam's gonna rise up through that column and vaporize all the liquid content of that batch. It's gonna leave all those solids that you saw in there behind, but take with it all the liquids, including our alcohols, right? Liquid ethanols, glycerols, things like that but also things that are packed with flavor from our grains, like oils, right? All of those are vaporized. They rise to the top of the column. We're gonna take them and we're gonna pass them through a chiller. Uh, it's our spirit still right there in the center. It's a chiller, it cools it down to where it recondenses back into a liquid. All right, now at that point, we have what's called low wine. Low wine is 125 proof, all right? We know how proofs work double the alcohol percentage, right? If you have an 80 proof bourbon, you have 40% alcohol, okay? Uh, so we went from 8% to roughly 62%, right? We're condensing that down, raising the percentage up. Now that is a once distilled moonshine, essentially, uh, that you have at that point. Uh, it's gonna have quite a few impurities in it, things like that. You don't necessarily wanna drink that right there. We clean it up, we distill it a second time. We do that in our doubler still, right there. Now that one's kind of weird looking. You can really see the copper that we use on that still right there. Uh, we use copper for a couple of reasons on our stills. First of all, copper sort of acts like a natural filter. Uh, it pulls out things like sulfites for us. They taste bad, some people are allergic to them, right? So we want to get as much of those out as possible. So we pull out those sulfites. Um, but also for the same reason that chefs love to use copper cookware. It's just the even heat distribution, right? It heats up very evenly. So everything that passes through our stills gets very even treatment because of that. Nothing comes out of that out of balance, right? We get really even treatment on our stills. So we've distilled that second time. Uh, we have what's called high wine. We actually have some coming out of the spout right there right now. Uh, but that high wine is 135 proof. Uh, 135 proof is what we distill at here at Jim Beam. Uh, now we do have limits at how high we can distill as well. Uh, to be called a bourbon whiskey, you're not allowed to distill any higher than 160 proof. All right, that's about 80% alcohol. Uh, you're gonna start losing flavor at that point, right? It's gonna start tasting a little bit more like vodka than bourbon, and we don't want that, right? We want all the flavors uh, from our grains that we can savor, right? We wanna preserve those. Keep them in our liquid all the way up into the barrel. So we distill that right at 135, okay? Uh, 125, because that's, you gotta put it in the barrel at least 125. Yep, yeah, and we'll see that here in just a second. All right, as we're coming out, come on up, dip a finger in there, give that a taste. This is good Kentucky water, is what this is. Come get you some refreshing water. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Fill up your water bottles. That's what you want to do here. All right. <laughs> How'd that water taste for you? Uh, it's that high wine, 125 actually, because what we've done, we've taken that high wine, we pump it up into the tank here. Uh, it's our proofing tank here on the wall. It's 135 proof, but we don't want it going into the barrel any higher than 125. So we bring that down. We just add water to it, right? All we're doing is cutting it, we're diluting it. Uh, so we add a little bit of water, bring that down to 125, uh, and we're going to throw it in the barrel here. That's what we just tasted. If you guys have heard the term white dog, white lightning, right? That's what this is. It's a pure grain alcohol. It's unaged. It's what we have right here. Now, some people, uh, they bottle and sell that product, like Makers uh, has a grain alcohol product. We used to. We did Jim Beam Ghost, right? Unfortunately, we're not selling Jim Beam Ghost anymore. It's pretty damn good. Uh, 
But that's what we just tried right there. Now, you tasted it, and it's kind of like rubbing alcohol, right? It's kind of strong. Your tongue is a little bit numb right now. But what did you guys smell? Did you smell it? Is it on your hand still? What do you smell? Sorry. What was that? I have to try it Oh, you have to try it again. <laughs> it smells really sweet, right? Uh, what was that? Bread. Yeah, it smells like bread, right? It's because of all those grains. Uh, we want all the flavors from those grains going into our barrel, so we keep it in that product. It's all those oils. Actually, it's why it rubs onto your hands real nice and soft, right? Uh, you can use it a little bit like lotion. Got some dry elbows. It'll work. Then we get some problems with the police in the car with you. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I uh, I will do that. I'll put a little bit on like uh, uh, like deodorant, right? Too, you know, you could do that. <laughs> Someday I'm going to get pulled over on the way home from work, and a cop is not going to believe me, and I'm going to be like, I swear, I work at Jim Beam, right? I reek of alcohol at the end of the day. Now our barrels. A couple things about our barrels. Uh, every single time we fill a barrel, it has to be three things for us. It's got to be new. It's got to be charred and it's got to be white oak every single time, right? It's got to be a brand new barrel. We cannot reuse our barrels at all. Uh, the obvious question there is what do we do with them, right? We sell them. We want to make a buck back off of them, so we send them to Scotland, right? We send them to Ireland. Uh, Scotch companies, Irish whiskey companies, uh, even tequilas and rums a lot of times will buy our barrels from us to age their own products in. Uh, add another level of flavor on top of their own products. The new trend that we're seeing right now is beers. We're seeing a lot of bourbon barrel infused beers on the market right now. So we're selling now to a lot of brewing companies, which is pretty cool. It's also got to be charred. Uh, we do what's called a level four char. Uh, it's precisely 55 seconds worth of charring the barrel. We call it an alligator char as well because it gets kind of a scaly texture right there. Uh, now when we're charring, what we're doing, we're essentially just caramelizing the natural sugars in the wood of the barrel. When you're making caramel in the kitchen, all you're doing is heating up sugar until it caramelizes, right? It's the same exact process here. Uh, the whiskey's gonna soak in and out of the wood. It's actually gonna pick up all those caramel flavors, all those vanilla flavors because of that caramelization, but it's also going to pick up caramel color, right? It goes in crystal clear to our barrel. It does not come out of the barrel that way. It comes out with that beautiful amber color uh, that we'll actually see here in a little bit, right? We love that amber color on the bourbon. Every bit of color that we get from this point on and every bit of additional flavor that we get from this point on all comes from the barrel. We never add any color additives, never any flavor additives as well, right? We can literally only ever add water to our product, okay? One of those times is right here, right? We proof that down uh, to 125. Now that's the point in the tour where everybody starts going, what about Jim Beam apple, vanilla, honey? Uh, all those different things, right? Uh, we've added a flavor additive to it, so it's no longer a true bourbon whiskey. Now we can say that we made it with Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, right? Because we're just infusing that with a flavor, but it's no longer a true bourbon whiskey. It's a flavored liqueur at that point, right? Also, it's, most of those are proofed down to about 70 proof, right? So that's another reason why minimum for a bourbon is 80, right? So a couple of reasons why those aren't true bourbons anymore. Now I saw you guys were noticing the barrel heads along the wall, right? Those are some of our milestone barrel heads, okay? Um, the coolest down here is that just this year we hit, filled our 15 millionth barrel. It was actually filled on March 12th of this year. You also notice that it only took us about two years to get from 14 to 15 million, right? We're moving fast. Production is picking up because demand is increasing, right? We're seeing sort of an explosion in bourbon. Uh, part of that is mainly because uh, the craft and premium bourbon industry is really taking off as well. Uh, Knob Creek is taking off. Uh, way faster than we, I think, ever really projected or expected it to about a decade ago, right? Uh, so we are having to pick up and we are putting barrels in our warehouses faster really than ever before, which is pretty cool, right? We'll actually see that 15 millionth barrel. It's in the warehouse that we're going to visit today, uh, which is pretty cool. All the employees here have signed it on the side. It's a pretty cool one to see. Nun sind wir bei den Gearbottichen und die sind groß und hoch. Im Hintergrund piepst der CO2-Alarm. Lange können wir nicht bleiben, aber wir können einen Blick in einen der Gärbottiche werfen. In here 22 total. 22 total. Some are not in this warehouse. One's bubbling quite a bit.
Anyone want to take a big whiff? Whip. All right, we do have to get out of here. We got a CO2 uh, got a light alarming us. <laughs> yeah. Look down through the grates though. See how far down these tanks actually go. Come on out, guys. Draußen, nach einem kurzen Blick über die Brennerei, die doch so anders ist als alles, was wir aus Schottland kennen, erfahren wir mehr über die Fermentation. We have 22 of those tanks total. All of them are over uh, 45,000 gallons worth. A couple of them are, uh, uh, hold more. They hold about 52,000 gallons. Uh, so it's quite a bit bigger than our 500 gallon tanks that we saw earlier. We put them on seven hour cycles so that every seven hours, one of those is fully fermented. Uh, we're gonna empty it out and we're gonna send it down this way to our main distillery. Now, did you guys see that we were agitating them as well, right? We had some spinners uh, and some of them were spinning fast, some of them slow, right? We agitate those batches uh, just to make sure that yeast is actually doing what we want it to be doing, right? Eating those sugars and actually uh, making the process of fermentation happen. Imagine that you're a yeast right here, and if that batch was entirely still, you would eat all the yeast around you and not know that there was a hell of a lot more of those sugars in the rest of the batch, right? Uh, so we're constantly agitating that, uh, especially towards the beginning to really get that yeast kick started. Uh, actually make it start doing what we want it to be doing, right? And throughout the entire process of those three days, uh, we're just kind of agitating that, making sure it's actually fermenting, things like that, okay? Uh, any questions about fermentation? Uh, the room that we just came out that had the ramp in there, if you guys saw those big long pipes in there, that's heat exchange, right? Uh, it's just really cold water pumping through those the whole time, trying to keep that room as cool as possible. Now we do shut down, in the summer, right? That's coming up here in about late July, maybe early August. We'll shut down for about a month or two just because of the heat, right? Uh, it's too much work for us to try to keep that facility cool. This facility cool with all of the heat that it's producing on its own, right? Uh, our facilities aren't going to be functioning properly, but also our workers uh, have to be in there too, right? We have to be leading tours through there. Uh, it's about getting to the point where it's going to be too hot in there in the afternoons to actually start uh, bringing our tour guests through. Uh, it's going to be kind of dangerous, right? It's really, really hot in those warehouses and down here in our distillery. So we do shut down uh, for a couple months. After that, we pick back up production. We run 24-7 down here. Did you guys see? Um, we'll have to step away from the bridge right there. The tall column coming out of the top of the green building right there on the right. That tall column up there is our beer still. All right, this one here is about six and a half stories tall. It's the one beer still that we have here. Every ounce of product that we make goes through that one beer still, right? That's the one that we have. Like I said, we run 24 seven. We don't really ever shut down unless it's for unplanned maintenance and that's no fun, uh, but we do shut down if we need to, right? Uh, but otherwise it's 24 seven. Like we sort of mentioned earlier, we do about 800 barrels a day here in this property. Uh, about 800 barrels a day is a regular pace for us. We increase, decrease that as needed, right? As demand, uh, certain projects come along, things like that. Uh, but about 800 barrels a day. Nun geht es in die eigentliche Brennerei, in der wir uns aber der großen Hitze wegen nur sehr kurz aufhalten. Drinnen spuren die Low und High Wines. Jetzt befinden wir uns an der Station, wo die Knob Creek Fässer geleert werden. Natürlich alles in Handarbeit. Alright, so this is our dumping porch. This is where we dump out our barrels for Knob Creek single barrel. Right? I know you guys have heard of that product. It's pretty damn good, right? 
Uh, it's all we dump out right here. Same thing with the bottling line that we're gonna see here in just a second. T-line is there. Uh, it's where we exclusively bottle Knob Creek single barrel as well. Uh, we don't really bottle anything else, but it's a cool one to see. When we get in there, you guys will get the chance to go to work for us, okay? Free labor is why we brought you here. All right, we're only half kidding <laughs> about that, <laughs> all right? Nobody, nobody's too upset about that, right? Uh, it's pretty cool, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Like I said, uh, Knob Creek single barrel is what we do here. Single barrel, of course, is what it says it is. It's the one single barrel, right? Uh, when we dump this out, we're not mixing that liquid in with any other barrels, right? Any of our other products are either a large batch or a small batch, right? Large batch is 800 to 1,000 barrels most of the time. We take them from all different sections in the warehouse, kind of like taking a cross section. Uh, we dump all those out, blend them together. It evens out our flavor, also gives us consistency. That's why our white label tastes the same every single time, right? Uh, now, a small batch is where you take a few hundred barrels, sometimes fewer than 100, uh, and you take them from all in one very specific area or sort of chunk in the warehouse, right? Um, because that one area has a different kind of aging experience than any other area in the warehouse, you're heightening that distinction, right? I know we've all heard of Baker's small batch, right? All of those barrels that we use, uh, they're aged in the top two floors of our warehouses, right? All in the upper floors for seven years. They take in a lot of heat, a lot of weather up there, okay? Uh, that's where we're getting that really wooden, really smoky, uh, kind of campfire flavor, right, on that product. You're just heightening that aging distinction, okay? Now, this barrel right here, 14 year old, all right? Put in the warehouse in 04. Yeah, it's actually 14 years and three months. 14 years and three months, all right. 14 year old barrel. Pretty cool, that's about as old as we get here, 14, maybe 15 years old. Um, minimum aging for Knob Creek single barrel, as you guys know, is nine years, right? Uh, but we do use well over that. Uh, we see a lot of 12-year-old barrels, 10-year-old barrels, uh, and of course, 14-year-old barrels as well. And when we dump this out, we're gonna see the difference, all right? Who wants to turn the barrel for me? Anybody? Roll the barrel. There we go. There's your money shot right there. <laughs> All right, turn it back up. What's the first thing you notice about that? The color. The color, right? Really, really dark. Uh, really, really dark for a bourbon. You're probably not gonna get that kind of color on a uh, four-year-old bourbon. Nothing at all wrong with a four-year-old bourbon, right? Uh, but you're just not gonna get this kind of color, okay? That's from 14 years of aging. Now, if we were to pass this around here in Kentucky, we call that a Southern Baptist Communion. Okay, right? If you're Catholics, I'll sprinkle you. Uh, now what we are gonna do, we're gonna take a finger and we're gonna dip it in, we're gonna give it a taste. All right? Uh, so I'll bring that around. I gotta hold the glass, sorry. It's not being wasted. I gotta hold the glass. Dip a finger. It's not being wasted, don't worry about it. That's actually the filter that we pass it through, okay? It's a silk mesh filter underneath there. Um, you guys see all the char that's caught on that filter? Right? All of this, we filter that out for you guys, that way you don't have to chew it, okay? Uh, it's a silk mesh filter, we pass it through that one. It goes through a second filter underneath that to catch finer particles. Uh, we'll put it into a steel barrel. We'll take it up to quality assurance, make sure everything's good to go. Uh, also, quality assurance, right? They taste yeah, it, make sure yeah. it's good, right? Um, and then from there, it's straight to our bottling line here, right? Did y'all taste it? Uh, no, we're not going to sip it. It has char in it, right? That's a hazard. <laughs> so this is actually a barrel that we're dumping out uh, just to go straight to the bottling line. Hier spülen wir unsere Flaschen mit Whisky aus, bevor sie auf der Bottling Line gefüllt werden. Diesen Vorgang verfolgen wir mit der Kamera.
bring it over here for me then. Am Ende der Abfüllungsanlage werden unsere Flaschen noch mit schwarzem Lack händisch versiegelt. Und dann bewegen wir uns ein Stockwerk höher in eine Abteilung, die unser Guide als Bourbon Jail bezeichnet. Was es mit dem auf sich hat? Genau. Alright, welcome to Bourbon Jail. Alright. This is where we bring you if you've had too much. Just kidding. That would only fuel the cycle, right? Uh, this is our quality. Is it? It's over there, isn't it? Right? Booker's Rise over there. This is our quality assurance. So we keep bottles from every single batch that we make. Um, just so that if somebody ever called us and they said, hey, something's wrong with my bottle. Uh, we can go to that exact serial code. We can figure it out, take it over to quality. They can make sure something's not wrong with it, right? Or figure where along the line it went wrong. Now, most of the time people call us and they say, something's wrong with my bottle. And we say, do you have children? Watering down mom and dad's liquor cabinet, right? Yeah. Um, and we cycle through these. Um, we only keep them most of the time for a few years, right? We're not going to have anything from like 2004 because it's almost guaranteed that all the bottles from a batch in 2004 I wish. Uh, I would be first in line before you guys if, if that was uh, coming out of there. So, yeah, just to let you know. So, no way to get it. No way to get it. Is Little Book still available or is it already uh, as well? All the Little Book of the previous batches. We should be coming out with a new one. I think it's going to be about August, maybe. A uh, new batch of Little Book's going to come out. But yeah, first edition, uh, pretty much sold out, yeah. Uh, you'll probably have to bargain with somebody for a bottle of that one, and it'll probably be a pretty hefty price. Yeah, people love the Little Book. Uh, but yeah, there's some pretty cool bottles in here. We got some Jim Beam Ghost, things like that that we don't have anymore. Some of the Jim Beam Ghost is in here, right? So what are the unlabeled ones? Which unlabeled ones? The one with the white label, one with the white label. The one down? Is it Booker's? Oh, I can't tell. Okay. Yeah, looks more like Basil Hayden to me. Okay. That's a Basil Hayden shaped bottle. Und dann führt uns der Guide zum Abschluss in einen Raum, der wie ein Museum aussieht und voller Dekante steckt. So we call this room our T. Jeremiah room. If you guys remember T. Jeremiah Beam from the Seven Generations, uh, he came right after Jim Beam. And right around the 60s, we saw really significant declines in our sales, um, sort of unlike anything the industry as a whole had seen before. Uh, so T. Jeremiah was responsible for doing something about that, right? Uh, first, he pushed us internationally. He uh, pretty much said, if I'm not selling it here, I'll sell it somewhere else, right? Uh, so we saw really significant international expansion at that point. That's why we call him our global ambassador for bourbon. Um, also, though, for here within the U.S., he started creating these custom ceramic decanters that we see in the cases here. And they really, really took off. And people loved them just for the novelty of them, the collectability of them, right? We've got all the model cars over that way, uh, model trucks and trains, things like that. Uh, but people loved collecting them. They made one for just about anything you could think. I like to point out there's a chainsaw decanter. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> also a car battery up here. So they just came up with all sorts of stuff to make them out of. Um, one that I point out, I don't know, if, have you guys seen the show I Dream of Genie? Yeah. I Dream of Genie. Yeah, we've got the, the Genie bottle right there, which is pretty cool. People like seeing that one right there. Uh, <laughs> it's a cool one. Are we waiting for somebody else in the bathroom? Well, that's great. Emily. Okay. Now, I did have a gentleman a few weeks back who had this uh, Chevy model right there, the orange one. He had that decanter, but he also had the exact same actual car. Yeah, which is pretty cool. He had all sorts of pictures of them side by side and stuff, so. Wieder draußen zieht es uns zu einem der Lagerhäuser. Die im traditionellen Stil errichteten Rickhouses am Gelände sind natürlich nur ein Bruchteil derer, die Jim Beam für seine Fässer braucht. Und innen, obwohl für den Besuch aufbereitet, bekommt man durchaus eine Vorstellung, in welcher Umgebung die Fässer hier mehrere Stockwerke hoch reifen dürfen.
Unseren Besuch bei Jim Beam in Clermont, Kentucky, beenden wir gegen Mittag, als die Hitze schon schwer auszuhalten ist und man nach jedem Flecken Schatten lechzt. Und zwar nach einem kurzen Fußmarsch mit einer Verkostung im Roten Haus rechts von uns. Die, die von Jim Beam nur den White Label kennen, sollten einmal die Small Batch Abfüllungen links im Bild versuchen. Knob Creek, Basil Hayden, Bakers und Bookers sind hervorragende Bourbons hoher Qualität. In diesem Sinne, stay on the beam und cheers!